Hi, everybody. So I'm Sean O'Neill. I'm from Optum Technology. Um, Optum Technologies is the business services wing of United Health Group. United Health Group's a big uh, um, health insurance Death Star. Um, we're their stormtroopers. So, uh, <laughs> you know, um, right when um, things went really south, um, exactly as Lou just pointed out, uh, CMS, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, um, looked out for help. Um, they also looked at all the different subcontractors that were working on the project and tried to find um, what components were, the, were maybe the least sucky. Um, <laughs> there was a company called QSSI that had built two of the uh, components. They were actually doing rather well. One was a data services hub. Um, so um, CMS awarded to QSSI the Master System Integrator Contract. Think of that as the general contractor. Um, the general contractor that gets to come in there and basically um, write the ship. Um, when we showed up, myself included, we had no idea what we were going to do. I, I've been running the APM group at Optum for about 10 years, so I know how to fix websites, but I didn't know exactly how I was going to contribute. Um, I literally, I brought, I bought two days worth of clothes, thinking I'd just show up, impart some wisdom, get the heck out of there. Um, I think it took me about three days before we even left the building so I could go to Target and buy more clothes. <laughs> but this story is about how those events are transforming our government. It's transforming the way that our government manages IT. And I'm going to tell you what happened after that healthcare.gov rescue. So, oh, slide. There we go. What went wrong? What? Immediately after we stabilized the website, this is something I got asked all the time. And, and you know what? I'm going to disappoint you. I'm not going to go through all the things that were wrong. Generally speaking, when people ask us that question, all they're really asking for, they want to hear the stupid things that people did. They want to think that it's not going to happen to you. Well, sorry, it wasn't anything special. There wasn't one stupid thing that they did and us guys came in and said, hey, there you go, you put the fizz knot and the whistle wugget and there you go, you're back online, you know. <laughs> Shoo, gonna go hang out with Obama. No. <laughs> you know. It was just a whole bunch of stuff that you probably run into a gazillion times yourself, you know. So here we go. It's a big long list. But it's stuff that we've all seen before. Most importantly, and at the very top of the list, was missing process. They have no really immature change, incident, problem, config, release, job control. Big one, exactly as Lou had said. There was no freaking monitoring uh, other than CNN. I mean, literally, we could, <laughs> <laughs> we, could, we could sit there and watch CNN. And they're like, oh, yeah, sweet. The website's down again because they're saying it on CNN. So you know, whatever. You know, load testing, completely inadequate, um, unclear lines of responsibility. I'm not going to read this list. You can read it, too. We're all nerds. Obviously, we can read. Um, but there's nothing in there that, that is really special. If anything, the biggest problem was that everything was broken. So everything that could go wrong did go wrong. And what we had to do is try to fix it in a very short order of time. So here's the nerd slide. You know, these are some of the things that we had to fix. Um, we'll talk about transparent huge pages afterwards if you ever really want to and why you should never enable that on a Mark Logic server running on a VM. Um, but it's really basic stuff. That in conjunction with all of the processes that we put in place were what righted the ship. But more importantly, if you have a massive list of technology changes that you need to push through an environment, you're going to have to also change the culture of that room the culture of the war room was more important than the technology changes I showed on the previous slide. This is a list that you can learn to live by. First one, verbal communication is OK. Not only is it faster to just say, yes, go. What are you going to do? I'm going to do this. OK, do it. No. More importantly, when you start using verbal communication, you are imparting trust, right? It's not, I'm going to follow that up with an email. You know, no, it's not. You're saying, I trust you. You're a smart person. Do what you're going to do. It's all right. Tell me later what you did. SOPs, 
Kind of keep flowing through this list. Mature that idea, get those standard operating procedures written down, and put them on a pre-approved list so that you are empowering any engineer to execute that fix when they see necessary. They don't have to go ask permission. Perfection is illusion. That's a really, really important one to moving fast. Yes, if you got a whole room like this and the war room was full of really smart people, all of us casting back, thinking about how we could change the website and re-architect this and bring in this new hardware and BS. We don't have time for that. How can you move forward on a 12-hour cycle? If we make an incremental change, that'll set us up for the next one for the next one, for the next one. Don't worry about getting to that end goal. Perfection is an illusion. Instead, focus on a 12-hour cycle. Diversity of thought is strength. This is the idea that if you get a room full of five techies like us, we're gonna come up with five pretty good solutions. And then, typically, we'll sit around and debate, which is gonna be the best one, and we'll lose three or four days. No, if you got five good ideas, let's go do all five of them right now. And while those are happening, we're gonna have another room where we got five other people coming up with the next things that you're gonna do that next day. And finally, this is an interesting concept. The passive voice sucks. It absolutely does. And we fall into that trap all the time when you're talking about, especially root cause. Well, that's when the server crashed and we restarted it, you know. You know so you gotta, you gotta say who is gonna do it? When are they gonna do it? Why are they gonna do it? The culture of the war room, the rules of the war room, and these um, right from the um, Time article, very important things that we put right on the wall. And these were, these were real rules. We could eject someone from the war room if you broke them. <laughs> Most importantly, don't focus on the past. Don't focus on how you got there. Focus on how you're going to get out of this problem. If you're going to go talk about who approved what or how you got there, Go do that someplace else. We're here to fix this website. And most importantly, who's going to be talking? It's the techies that know the most. How many times have you been working on a problem, and that person says, well, you've got to talk to my vice president, got to talk to the senior vice president. You go up the chain and back down the chain. No. I need to talk to your techies. Get out of the effing room. Get your techies in here right now, and we're going to talk man to man. So. <laughs> And most importantly, stay focused on the things that are going to hurt us in the next 24 hours. Don't worry about how you're going to completely re-architect the website. Let's do this right now. So in summary, the problems that plague the website were nothing special, but how we fix those problems was. And the culture changes that we put in place are now rippling through the government in many exciting ways. It's, when I first got off the project, it was all about, let's stop another healthcare.gov. But no, the, the conversation is changing. It's changing in our whole industry. It's about transforming the way that our government interfaces with its citizens in its digital experience. Now, here is the fun slide. It's a bit of an eye chart, but um, this is where things were basically when we got there. Classic website circa 1998. Um, and then where we're going now. Instead of having proprietary private clouds, we're going to public clouds. And we'll talk a lot about that in a bit here. Instead of doing expensive, very expensive hardware, proprietary hardware, let's use Amazon. Instead of going with um, expensive RDBMSs, we're uh, using MySQL, but more importantly, the free version. CMS um, <laughs> really didn't want to give any money to Oracle after a while. Um, <laughs> so, so, so we also had Tivoli. And CA Capacity Manager, these were some tools that were sitting around when we got there. Um, completely uh, replaced with New Relic APM. New Relic Insights, um, doing all of the capacity management, being able to see where we need to add that. Instead of Java application servers, which are still out there in, in, en masse, we've been moving a lot of things to Node and Nginx. And it goes on and on. Instead, uh, no automation. We now have Jenkins and Puppet. Instead of a cold standby data centers, we're talking about multiple EC2 availability zones, geodispersed data centers, the one on the west coast, one on the east coast. Um, instead of the, uh, taking off the shelf bloatware, and that was an interesting term when the, uh, the Optum communications person that reviewed my slides said, what's, what's bloatware? And I'm like, don't worry, everybody knows what bloatware are. You know, so, and then, 
And then he's like, roll your own. What is that? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like don't worry, I'm in California. They're going to know. <laughs> so, anyways, you know, instead of static content, we're pushing as much as we can into, into Akamai. Um, you'd go on that site now, and there's a ton of dynamic, personalized content that is delivered 100% via JavaScript, not even a server involved. And finally, a lot of end user visibility now into the end user experience so that we can do A-B testing and roll out changes incrementally. Uh, this is something I really would like to plug, and I'm open to talk more um, the rest of the, the event about using the plugins. This is a massive list. We used a lot of the community versions, and we also rolled our own. Um, and it allowed us to be able to have deep visibility into many different components. But this changes the culture of IT in our government because instead of being slaves to crappy off-the-shelf software that you then have to buy an expensive monitoring package to view, you now can write your own software, write your own plugins, use New Relic, monitor it, roll it out, and save the American taxpayer a crap load of money. <laughs> so, the other thing that we've been doing a lot with, and this is where um, we'll spend a bulk of uh, time talking here, is the use of public clouds. I mean, public clouds, um, they're awesome, right? Um, it's very cheap, but it really fits the way that government works. For, for one thing, once again, you know, for all American citizens in the room, you're paying for this IT. Would you rather have our government use EC2, which is massively cheaper than a private data center? Um, and most importantly, throughout the government, we have these cycles um, of business, the Black Friday thing. You've got an open enrollment period, right? At the end of open enrollment, we'll be at 10x the volume that we had on a non-enrollment day. So instead of in the, in the old way of thinking, we would fill up a whole private data center, and that hardware would sit cold 364 days of the year. Instead, using the cloud, that saves, once again, all of us a lot of money. But are public clouds secure? Well, this is A number one, because believe me, <laughs> being the poor guy that had to go in front of the uh, uh, the architecture board and argue to get new relic in place. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, everyone was just, it was tough because they're like, you're gonna, you're gonna use cloud, you're gonna send all of this information up to a SaaS provider. But the data was there. It was an extremely heated exchange. At, one, at twice, actually, they thought that the uh, angry architect, as we call them, was gonna leap over the table and punch me. Um, <laughs> but if we can make the case that we said, no, here's all the certifications of new relic, here is how we're going to transfer the data. It's going to be secure, and this is how we're going to remediate it. Once again, for the people that are in the public sector and you're having challenges with that, please talk to me, and I can give you a lot of information that you can use to justify using cloud technologies in government um, uh, projects. Um, additionally, um, as we move more and more things to the cloud, we now have very hardened server images. Um, those hardened server images are also layered with threat detection um, all the way around um, the environment. Um, also, for um, as some of you may know, Amazon will let you put your own network switch gear in their data centers, and that allows us also to have a management zone that's 100% private. Um, and there is a ton of other stuff I'm not going to say in public, um, but once again, if you, if you want to um, talk to me afterwards, I can give you some ideas about how, on an extremely sensitive government projects, you can use the private cloud if you do it right. So these are two case studies we're going to go through. Um, uh, the, oh, before I go to my case studies, um, they all center on a hybrid cloud. Now, because it's one thing to have a guy come up in the front of a tech room and say, move everything to the cloud, dudes. You know, but um, it's going to take a while, right? You've got some things that you can't easily move to cloud. Uh, for us, that's Mark Logic. The way that we use Mark Logic doesn't fit currently with the Mark Logic cloud offering. So right now, we still need to have those back-end services within the private cloud, within the private data center. But we're pushing as, mus as, most <laughs> as much as we can into the um, public clouds. And here's a really great example. 
So we called it the scalable login system. Now, there, um, the identity management system that was in place when we, when we first got out there was one that caused a lot of problems. Um, so um, we tuned the heck out of it. Uh, we, even though it was an Oracle project product, we put New Relic all over it, and we were able to tune it to 53 logins per second. The next year, um, in a really good partnership with Oracle, we were able to tune it to get to 154 logins per second. But still, it was an expensive, um, locked in the data center solution um, that was very complex. So we rewrote the thing. It now r runs 100% in Node.js and MariaDB, runs in the Amazon cloud, purely in the cloud. And now we have 346 logins per second. That's insane. It's just freaking crazy. On a, on a product that is extremely simple, everybody knows how to use it. It's not using proprietary caught software. We also did a very similar one for the um, app 2.0 you may have heard about. Um, this was after the first year of enrollment. We found that 70% of the applications were simple. And so we built a new system um, out there, uh, runs 100% in AWS. Um, it needs Nginx, Node.js, backed by MariaDB, and is able to move people through their applications much quicker. It's only about 12 steps you know, versus over 70. Plus, it only takes maybe 10 minutes instead of an average of 40. And more importantly, by putting this technology into the cloud, we never touched a line of code of the back-end systems. So in order to make a transformational change in the, in the uh, citizen experience, we didn't change any of the system itself put this thing into the cloud where it's extremely cheap and gave us massive degrees of flexibility. At this point, I want to talk about the United States Digital Service. So many of us that had come out for the surge, the tech surge, some of them, including Mikey Dickerson and Todd Parks, have gone on to form the United States Digital Service. This is a new service within our government that focuses its approach on embedding technologists like us inside agencies where we can make real change. And this is working. They've been up for over a year, and they've been making changes in, the, um, in immigration, especially in veterans affairs. That's when there's a lot of focus on restoring the experience of our veterans. And this is how we can all make this change. I strongly suggest that you look into the United States Digital Service as a way that you can put your skills to work to be able to help change the way that our government has IT. And more importantly, I do want to point out one, th one thing. These are, all these slides have said Optum, and I'm speaking you, to you today. And every time I say we, I'm not just saying we as in Optum. I'm thinking about the best team I've ever had the pleasure of working with. These are the guys and, and gals from Accenture, from CGI, from Verizon, from HP, and all the folks that came out from all the technology firms and have joined the United States Digital Service where they can change our country. And I implore you to take a look and see how you can do it. How can you can change the way that our government interfaces with the, our citizens and leave your mark in history. Thank you.